Today is Thursday, November 20th, 2014, and we are interviewing former Director of Public Relations, Reginald Wallace. And, uh, well, Reg, I have to start by saying that uh, it is a pleasure to have you on the program again. And I want to start by uh, talking about your 80th birthday on November 5th of this year. You right, turned yeah. 80. You were born uh, November 5th, 1934, height of the Great Depression, and you grew up uh, during not only the Depression, but the early war years. What was it like working on a farm as a young man in Crowville, Louisiana, in the early to mid-1940s? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you, it was, it was hard work back in those days, you know. The agriculture changed a lot since the 1940s. The uh, technology was just evolving back then. A few people had tractors, but uh, a lot of them uh, farmed with uh, livestock, you know, and, and things like that. So agriculture has changed, and it was, uh, you know, the, agri uh, the uh, economic source in, in, in rural parishes like Franklin Parish, but certainly not, didn't have the scope that it has today, you know, in our economy. I know that, uh, as you mentioned, uh, you know, you, you were raised on a farm. Your younger brother, Buddy, actually uh, stayed on the farm. Yeah, he and, did. And he, he farmed, but, uh, you know, it, it was a very rural time in our nation's history, but a lot of folks still lived on a farm, and they kind of understood and appreciated the value of agriculture because they were directly connected to it. I mean, uh, your neighbors obviously farmed. What was it just like in the farming community back then as far as, uh, agriculture being the basis for that, that economy? Well, you know, that would uh, take a day and a half to answer, you know. <laughs> but it was, uh, it, life was, uh, was great on a the farm. There's no question about it. Uh, families were close and tight and uh, everybody uh, did their fair share of work on the farm, you know, and uh, they, they, the, the the values of family values back in those days I think that we refer to today were kind of halfway established back back then you know and so uh, I en I enjoyed uh, coming up and being raised on a farm my f my my father was a farmer he he was raised on a farm and uh, he bought a farm and he raised me on a farm and farming was all that he uh, he knew. How many and, acres was your farm and what did you grow? Well, <clears throat> when uh, I was a, a young a teenager, uh, we farmed about, uh, started out farming about 150 acres and then uh, it finally grew to uh, 300 acres and, and on up. Uh, and so we grew, uh, back in those days, uh, cotton was king, you know. Not anymore, but it was back then. Uh, everybody wanted to raise cotton. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the change from uh, cotton to soybeans and corn was difficult for cotton farmers because they, that's all they knew was how to farm uh, cotton. And uh, for some reason, uh, the economy changed and it became more profitable to raise corn and, and, and soybeans than it did to raise cotton. It's, it, Cotton and that an cotton infrastructure never came back. No, and, and it never came back. Uh, it was a, an expensive crop uh, to raise, and uh, I guess uh, one of the reasons that cotton never came back uh, to the extent that it once had, the stature that it once had, was because uh, synthetics, you know, came on board and things like that. And then uh, there was a guy that, uh, that's when farmers formed, uh, organized the uh, Cotton Incorporated. I don't know if you remember or mm -hmm. are familiar with Cotton Incorporated. Uh, the, the first uh, staff man and uh, president of Cotton Incorporated was a, a man by the name of Duke Wooters. He organized that. And uh, I was uh, with him and uh, he came to Louisiana to be introduced to various farm organizations and farmers in, in the state. And so I carried him around and everything like that. And he told me, he said, uh, we're fixing to uh, organize a marketing for cotton uh, on uh, 
a grand label, and you know, we're going to make blue jeans and cotton shirts the thing to wear. And uh, I kind of question that because back in those days, uh, uh, teenagers didn't they didn't want to wear blue jeans and cotton shirts and things like that. But you know that rascal turned it around. He made it big time. And the teenagers, not only in, in rural areas, but in major population, major cities, wanted uh, those cotton shirts and those blue jeans and things like that. And he turned it around. And uh, I'm not saying that it solved the problems of uh, the cotton farmer, but it certainly helped. You spent uh, most of your life uh, behind a microphone at some point or another. I your, did. Uh, your broadcast career actually began when you were in uh, college as a teenager. You ironically started at the local radio station in Winsboro, KMAR, and ironically you retired from there that's, earlier that's this right. year. That's right. Tell me about how you got your first job in radio. Well, I just always wanted to be a broadcaster. and. Uh, I was a, a student, as you said, at, at Louisiana College, and I came home in, in, in the summer. And uh, Buddy Martin, who owned, uh, uh, who's, he and his dad owned the auction barn in Delhi, and my dad knew him and everything. And I went out and asked Buddy Martin for a job that summer, and uh, so he gave me the job, and I didn't know I was going supposed to get paid for it, and so I went. And I worked two or three months, and I never went in for a check or anything like that. And finally, uh, uh, Mr. Martin came up to me and he said, uh, "Reginald, uh, you got you got to come by and pick up your checks. You know, we're, we're paying you." I said, "You're paying me." <laughs> I didn't know that, and so uh, that's how I started out at at uh, at KMAR. And um, the way I finished there, I. I uh, worked uh, seven years at Channel 5 in Alexandria. I did the sports uh, down there, and uh, I also hosted uh, an hour long, I believe it was either 30 minutes or an hour, uh, noontime program. And so they wanted uh, to put some agricultural news in it, and they said, can you, uh, can you do that? And so I said, yeah. I think I can. I was raised on a farm, and so I got in touch with the county agents and the Farm Bureau presidents and everybody like that, and so it uh, it worked out real good, and uh, the Farm Bureau liked what I was doing with Farm Bureau in at Channel 5, and they said, uh, they called me and said, uh, well, why don't you come and uh, get on our staff and do, let's organize this statewide like that. And so it sounded like a good idea, especially when they told me what they was going to pay me to do it. And uh, I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm on my way. And that's how I wound up with, with the Farm Bureau. And I stayed with them for a long time. Well, I, I want to back up just a little bit because um, you actually had a broadcast career during your military service, uh, uh -huh. something that uh, how, how, how did that come about? Uh, how did you go from soldier to broadcaster? Well, uh, I was drafted. They, they wanted me to volunteer, but if I'd volunteered, I'd had to sp spend four years, or maybe even six, I forget exactly whether it was four or six, and I didn't want to spend that much time in there. So they said, well, we'll you'll, you'll be, uh, you know, packing a rifle and this, that, and the other, and everything like that. And I said, well, I'd rather do that for uh, two years and something else for six. And so they, they drafted me and carry, uh, uh, brought me in, and uh, they looked at my resume and my uh, degree and everything. And so they sent me to uh, uh, headquarters company USAR Pack in Honolulu, Hawaii, what a place to be stationed. Yeah, and I worked in the office of uh, General I.D. White, a four-star general, for four years. Now, he didn't know me personally or anything like that, but we worked in his I.O. office for four years there, and uh, that involved uh, 
uh, getting press releases out and doing radio programs. When I first went over there, what they wanted me to do was to, to establish a radio network, but that never did uh, go through. We did some radio programs, but we never did uh, pull the uh, organization of a network off. So uh, it, it involved mostly uh, uh, newspaper and, uh, and some radio mm -hmm. like that. Well, let, we'll, we'll fast forward to 1969, I believe, uh -huh. which was the year you started with Farm Bureau. Was it 69? I think so, yeah. So you, you come to the Farm Bureau with the concept of trying to start a statewide broadcasting operation to bring farm news across the state. Uh, but the radio network took a little while because it didn't start till about 75 or 76, and the television program didn't start until the 80s. What, what, was, what was going on in those initial years when you were trying to, to get that broadcast operation off the ground? Well, it was just a lot of organization and a lot of groundwork and, and things like that and figuring out how, how to do it, you know. And uh, I, uh, about that time, the uh, uh, LN, uh, the news LN uh, came on board and they called me and said, uh, you know, we can't afford uh, an agricultural network or staffing it or anything like that. Would uh, you as a director of uh, information for the Farm Bureau like to assume that responsibility and develop an ag network in the state? Well, that made my job easy because I had an I was fixing to organize a network with a network that was already had uh, affiliates and things like that. And so I just bounced at that. And so uh, my office remained in the Farm Bureau. And uh, we had a problem with it, though, several years later with the National Association of Farm Broadcasters. They found out that I was doing the farm broadcasting, not only for Louisiana, but it was for Mississippi, and I think even some stations in uh, Alabama and Georgia back in those time, days. And uh, so they, they didn't like that, the National Association of Farm Broadcasters, and they started uh, putting the heat on me and on the Louisiana network on my doing the broadcast and not being an NAB member. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, a member of their organization, or in their opinion, a farm broadcaster. And so LN said, well, we'll solve that. They had a guy by the name of Don Molino who was there. And so they made on paper Don Molino the director of agricultural programming on the uh, Louisiana radio network. but. Don didn't do any agricultural program. He stayed in the news department and did what he always did, and I continued to do the uh, the farm programming. Well, that lasted for a while until they found out what I was doing, <laughs> what we were doing, and so they came down on that, and uh, pretty soon uh, uh, Don had to do X number of minutes a day of farm programming, and I had to file reports on his show, and that lasted until I retired. Um, when we began the radio network, uh, I, there were, when I started with you in 1985, uh, we were delivering programming to about five of our local affiliates that, yeah. what later became the Louisiana Farm Bureau Agri-News Network. Yeah, yeah. But, um, was it difficult to sell agricultural programming to radio stations because in some areas some affiliates might not have thought that their listeners had any connection to agriculture. Yeah. I mean, well at first it was you know when you walked in and said you know we would like to do agricultural programming for you and this and that and the other and uh, they didn't understand the potential but once they got associated and they found out uh, there were agricultural chemical dealers and th people like that that did business with farmers that spent a lot of money in advertising and things like that, then it became much, much easier because they've, 
And uh, to be honest with you, uh, a few years into that, they found out that the ag network was bringing in more money than the news network because of ag chemicals. Fast forward to September 24th, 1981, when This Week in Louisiana Agriculture signed on with uh, KNOE TV. Uh, I remember you telling me you had to go before the Farm Bureau's Board of Directors to get money to start the television program, and there was one particular board member who effectively said, Wallace, for that kind of money, you better make it work. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and he was from Monroe. I'm not going to call names because uh, he's not with us anymore. But anyway, he was a nice guy. But uh, the Farm Bureau board was a very conservative board, just like it is today, you know. And if you had to spend money, you'd had to make a little money somewhere uh, down the road. And, uh, and it did, you know. And uh, the man who was the biggest a challenger to us at the beginning was the biggest supporter on down the road. Was it, did you have some sleepless nights when you thought, I'm getting ready to start, to try to start a statewide television program, something that has never really been done before in Louisiana and only had been done by a handful of stations across the country or entities across the country trying to bring agricultural news to urban Louisianians. I mean, were there some sleepless nights thinking, what am I, what have I gotten myself into? Well, I, I had, uh, I questioned that, you know, and everything. But like I say, by that time, uh, some in the, agri uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the field of advertising had come to realize that uh, agriculture was a big economic uh, ma mesh or mast in the uh, in Louisiana and in the Southeast and things like that, that and, and there was there was money to be made from uh, uh, farm farm programming, and so television was a different animal, and it started. Uh, we started off with little five-minute segments on noon and morning reports and things like that, and then uh, it evolved. At KNOE, they said, well, we'll air a 30-minute program. If you can do it, do one a week. And so I thought about that, and we did it. And uh, since we were doing it, we figured, well, maybe uh, the other markets in the state would like to air the program, too. And so we went around and uh, showed them what we were doing and things like that. And they, and just about every market in the state uh, picked up that 30-minute program and aired it. They didn't air it in prime time, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but uh, it was on in ever, just about every market, including New Orleans. Well, today, this week in Louisiana agriculture is broadcast on 18 statewide affiliates and yeah. nationally through RFD in Nashville. 400,000 viewers a week watch that show. Yeah. Did you ever think that this week in Louisiana agriculture would not only be a statewide phenomenon, but uh, we, we get we get emails from viewers all over the country every week. Did that, I, does that I, surprise you? I did, yeah, it did. I, I never dreamed that big. Uh, Mike Dana had to dream that big <laughs> <Well>. <laughs> and set that up, you know. Well. I never dreamed but it we, would be well, horrible. We stood on your shoulders, that's for sure. Um, talk to me about your career. Uh, you know, you worked for Farm Bureau for 30 years and mm -hmm. uh, you know obviously it was a career you found very rewarding because you had done secular news, you had done military broadcasting, you had done disc jockeying. Uh, obviously you found your job very rewarding. What was the most uh, rewarding thing? What kept you around for 30 years? I, I really don't know other than my, uh, my love for broadcasting and uh, doing what I did, you know whether it was agriculture or sports or whatever, you know, I, I enjoyed it as long as it was in, uh, in the broadcast business. And I started out in, in sports. And uh, so that, I guess that, that, that'd be all I can say about that. I just love what I was doing. You had two careers after you left the Farm Bureau. You went to work for KMAR, and it's hard for me to believe 
you worked for 16 years at that station before you retired a second time. And so yeah. obviously uh, you did love what you were doing and your program around Franklin was quite a, quite a listen to program. I think I recall talking to Tom Gay Jr. who said, uh, he said, Reg, if you'd like to come back to work for me, he said, uh, I'll, I'll give you half of what you sell and you pretty much sold the entire year's programming in about six weeks. And yeah, so, uh, that's right. Obviously, the, the, the voice of Louisiana agriculture was still recognized in your hometown, yeah. even though you were not on the Farm Bureau network. Right. So you obviously enjoyed, enjoyed what you did. Yeah, I did. And I enjoyed when I came back to uh, uh, KMAR, I enjoyed uh, my work there, you know. You know, you, you spent a lifetime in agriculture, being raised on a farm, uh, delivering farm news to hundreds of thousands of viewers every week between the radio network and the television program. Uh, has this week in Louisiana agriculture, have we made inroads into the general consuming public today about the importance of agriculture and just how important farmers are? I think so. I, I think that uh that uh, people are beginning to realize that uh, agriculture is not only a major economic factor in the, in the communities, but it's uh, it's the uh, the industry that puts the food on the table. You know, people are beginning to uh, over the past several years see see that and to appreciate uh, what farmers are doing. And uh, the I don't know how to say this, but uh, Back in the old days, they thought of farmers as, uh, you know, uh, somebody that walked behind a plow and, and things like that and didn't understand the economy and the size of the uh, economy of, of agriculture. And I think people now uh, understand that because of, uh, of farm, not far just farm broadcasting, but uh, uh, several things. Yeah, I, th I think agriculture, uh, I think as we know, uh, agriculture is a, a, a global industry. You know? Yeah. Uh, uh, we've done our program from 15 foreign countries on four continents and yeah. 28 states and I, I think uh, when you ask a farmer today, uh, not only does he want to know what his next door neighbor is doing or what his neighbor in the neighboring state is doing, but he wants to know what farmers in other parts of the world are doing because that economy is directly tied together and I think I think our program has done a pretty good job yeah, of yeah. showing viewers how that whole thing comes together uh, you know it, did you did you ever think that this week in Louisiana agriculture would end up in places like China and Turkey and the Middle East? Not not even one day. <laughs> I didn't. Were there any stories that you covered Ridge that kind of stick out in your mind that were very memorable for you, uh, either from just a perspective of that was a good way to tell that story or something that you started out in one direction and it kind of ended up in another direction. Any, any stories that kind of stick out in your mind that you covered over all those years? You know, I can't think of any because there were so many. Right. You know, I, everything stands out in my mind that you know, what we did over the years uh, because I was enjoyed, uh, enjoying doing it while I was doing it. I know you worked with a lot of good people over the years. Uh, we always had kind of a small, a small staff. This was not done by a, by large production crews no. and lots of people. Uh, uh, what, is, what, what, what is it? What did it say to uh, your commitment and the company's commitment to letting you do this? And you didn't really need a lot of whole, a lot of people to do yeah. it. Well, first of all, you had to prove yourself on that, you know, and make, and make the economics of it work out. And it had, we had a giant staff when I first started, me, <laughs> you know. Uh, and uh, we finally added uh, one person and then another person. And when I left, we had three. I think now uh, the de information department at Farm Bureau, I, they have several people down there well, now it, working it, for them. It doubled from, well, just a little bit better than double. We went from three to seven. But, Three to seven. But I think we've reached critical mass on that yeah, number. And, uh, yeah. we just, we've just run out of geography. But, uh, uh -huh. you know. Well, so y you turned 80 back on November 5th. Yeah. You have had two retirements. You have three grandchildren. You have a great-grandson who is named after you. Yeah. Um, what does Reginald Wallace do now? 
I don't know. <laughs> I'll just have to do it as it, the opportunity presents itself, you know. But I don't think I'll ever quit working altogether, you know. I, uh, I don't have a, a part-time job now or anything like that, but uh, I, I'll, I'll always do something relating to agriculture and what I've done all my life. Guys? Um, I think that pretty much covered most of it. The only, uh, only thing I would ask you, Reg, since the time you started <coughs> going on, 1961 was your first broadcast job? Mm, goes back so far, I, I can't remember, but somewhere no, so in high school. I was say, what's changed the most in that time that you didn't what, what surprises you the most that just the, the biggest change between the technology farmers use, the technology broadcasters use? The, 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 the change between the started, technology for farming or broadcasting? Both. 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 Let's, let's touch on farming first. What, yeah. You, know, you talked about some people used to still use animals out in their fields. Okay. Now they have tractors that drive themselves. What, yeah. what have you seen change over those years? Well, in agriculture, the changes in my lifetime have been enormous. When I was a, a kid uh, coming up on the farm and my dad was farming, uh, uh, they farmed with, uh, with mules and, a, and plows and things like that. I can remember that. Now, as time passed, of course, uh, they moved from that to little one-row ro tractors, you know. That was those who could afford to buy the one-row tractors and, and everything. And it was a mixture of that little uh, B. John Deere or little Farmall and, uh, and the, uh, the mules and things like that. And then it just blossomed all of a sudden and uh, agriculture came a big economic uh, industry and the technology changed with the growth of agriculture and uh, the impact on the economy of our country was uh, agriculture was the number one uh, not only uh, agricultural uh, uh, part of the economy, but just uh, the economy itself. I mean, it was, uh, it was tremendous and it just grew. And it, uh, it not only involved employment by people who uh, drove the tractors and farmed the land, but the people who manufactured the tractors and things like that, it just, it was a big industry. When you first started here, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, after 30 years, the day you left, we still had cassette decks and reel-to-reel -reel recorders in our radio studio. That is absolutely right. I, I talked to you about that <laughs> you, you, <laughs> this you, morning. You know, you, we, I was we, like, where are the old reel-to-reel? -reel? We talked about, and, I, and there were times, Reg, when I was learning how to do that from you, that you, you, you spoke to me in a stern tone of voice about how to operate the equipment because I was a newspaper reporter who didn't know very much about the mechanics of broadcast. Yeah. But, you know, I, I often, occasionally I've had to stand before this board of directors and ask them for money for television operations. And, mm -hmm. uh, but I think $150,000 in 1983 got you one camera, one tripod, one editor, one light, and one microphone. Mm -hmm. Today, $150,000 will just about supply you an entire editing studio. You can buy yeah. multiple cameras. The, the technology has gotten smaller and more affordable, uh -huh. uh, but we still joke that the cheapest thing in television is the talent because the equipment is still pretty expensive when yeah. you look at it yeah. in the long haul. But, um, you know, I, I think when, when we look back, uh, on all of the changes that our television program has made over the years, I think the, the one constant is that somebody had to stand originally before that board of directors and ask to let this process give it a shot, and that person was you. And I can yeah. tell you that 
on behalf of the Public Relations Department and probably farmers all over the state and all over the country, we certainly thank you for your willingness to to take that risk because uh, well you, it was a risk because people didn't know much about you know the technology of broadcasting or anything like that at the time and uh, you know back in those days uh, instead of taking the camera to the person you were going to interview you had to bring the person to the camera that thing weighed <laughs> I don't know how much. Way more than me. Yeah, oh, a whole lot more than you. <laughs> it was big. Yeah, I can recall David Langley and I on many a many a hot August day dragging that gear through cotton fields and corn fields, and mm -hmm. and I can remember thinking to myself, you know, this has got to be a young man's game because at some point I'm not yeah. going to be able to do this anymore. And as much as I hate to say it, at 54 years old. It's a good thing the cameras have gotten smaller because there's yeah, no way today right. that I could carry those big cameras and tripods because... And in the, in, in the day that I was talking about, there's big old studio cameras. Yeah. You didn't take, no, they didn't you didn't the take them anywhere. You had to bring the people to them. And I, 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 I came up during that time. Yeah, I remember. I remember. All right, guys. Anything else? I think we covered it. All right.